Hello, I'm Richard Clark, and here we are back with this, the third part in the series where we work our way through infamy, infamy, looking at each section of rules a uh, step at a time. Uh, we're here today to talk about missile fire, but before we do, I'd like to address a couple of questions that cropped up from the last programme when we looked at movement. Firstly, there was the issue of mobs moving in an uncontrolled manner. My old friend Mitch Badinka, uh, in Washington State, uh, over there on the west coast of the United States of America, got in touch to say that I hadn't made it entirely clear that groups uh, moving in an uncontrolled mob add further to their movement. He's absolutely correct. Uh, I did infer it. I did suggest that their maximum uh, movement allowance was one which included that option of six points of further in it, but I was not totally clear in stating it as I had done for mobs moving in a controlled fashion. Any barbarian groups with further, whatever their order, will add that uh, amount of inches, that number of inches, to their movement uh, when they when they move. Uh, so thanks to Mitch for that. We also had a comment from a gentleman Leslie in the Normandy in France, in northern France, who pointed out that I'd completely forgotten to cover foot cavalry. And he was absolutely right, somewhat embarrassing, uh, because they are pretty important. Uh, so I thought we'd do that immediately rather than leave it for the FAQ because it is important and it would be a shame if we didn't cover it here. So let's have a look at foot cavalry. I've actually just got some um, uh, Gallic cavalry here who uh, are standing in uh, at this moment in time because I have them to hand and they are combining with a group of warriors. Now we've got a group of warriors here and what we do to show that they are um, <coughs> moving together as foot cavalry is we place four of those figures there. It just allows us to give that representation of the fact that there are men in amongst the horses. This is very much like, and I've said this before, so I'm sorry if I'm boring you with it, but this is very much like the Scots Greys at Waterloo. There are lots of accounts of infantry grabbing onto the horses' manes or bridles in the case of, uh, probably in the case of the Scots Greys, um, uh, and moving together with cavalry to gain that uh, faster movement. And this is certainly something that we read about in the ancient tracts when it comes to several nations, certainly uh, Iberians and also Germans. So foot cavalry tract, the trait allows some mounted troops and foot warriors to act in concert. So we've got these here. Uh, they move when they're activated, or they deploy as well, when they are activated by the leader of the mounted warriors. So these guys will come on, uh, in a, uh, deployed with the uh, cavalry and infantry together, but they move when the commander of the mounted warriors uh, card comes out the deck. They move at mounted speed, but they're unable to step out whilst doing this. It's just a limitation that basically says cavalry can't gallop because the guys are just going to fall off, um, but they uh, will move together. Now the warrior, the foot warriors can dismount at any time within the limit of that cavalry's movement range, including going straight into contact with the enemy, as we saw chariot warriors mounted do. So let's have a look here. These guys have got a Roman line in front of them, uh, eight inches away. So let's just assume for the sake of this example that uh, the cavalry have rolled eight inches of movement. What they are able to do is to deploy that full group of foot warriors directly into combat with the uh, Romans there because eight inch, they are within that eight inches which is their maximum movement. So they will deploy straight into contact there and then the cavalry would, will withdraw to a supporting point to act as a rallying point behind them. Now that does in theory mean that the cavalry have moved up and moved back but we're not bothered, we're simply restricting it by the maximum range is how far they can go and how far they can deploy uh, those foot warriors. They can't move up to the limit of their uh, range uh, movement range and then deploy forward from that or to the side but they uh, can, uh, must do it within uh, the range of their potential movement. Now we do have a variation on that theme. Foot warriors can leave the cavalry at any time when their own leader's card is dealt but only if they've not been activated on the cavalry leader's card during that turn. They can't activate twice so uh, 
They deploy together, they move together until the foot warriors dismount, be that into combat or not, and once they dismount, that's the end of the partnership for the game. They can't mount up again. It's not an Uber service. Right, hopefully that clears up those omissions. My thanks to both those gentlemen for their, for their comments, and as I say, it's something I wanted to deal with now and here in this video. Okay, so let's talk about shooting. Uh, what we'll do first, as we've done before, is we'll look at foot troops and then we'll move on and look at mounted troops. Now, we'll clear some of these away and look at the groups that we've got. Now, we've got two uh, sorts of foot troops that can shoot. Uh, basically, we've got warriors and we've got skirmish troops. So the warriors could be our barbarians, who I've just chucked away, or they could be our Roman warriors um, and our skirmishers, obviously are going to be people like these uh, British slingers or maybe like these um, uh, Spanish slingers who are serving on the Roman side. Now, uh, warriors usually just throw spears or pillar in the case of uh, Roman legionaries. Skirmishers throw javelins, they shoot arrows or they loose slingshot. There is a hybrid troop type, which is warriors, who have flexible drill, and they can act in close or open order, very much like the Roman legionaries, or they can act in skirmish order, very much like those skirmishers. The way they will throw missiles will be determined by what order they are in, how they're operating. Are they operating as drilled regular troops, or are they operating as skirmishers? Now, any troops armed with missiles can shoot. You just need to be sure that the shooter can see the target with an unbroken clear line of sight that doesn't come within two inches of enemy troops. So, if we had uh, our barbarians here, and we had our Roman legionaries here, and we had our Balearic slingers here, they could still shoot at the uh, barbarian warriors. However, because the line of shot would be within two inches of these guys, the hits would be spread between the two groups. They'd be shared between them. So it's a risky business and probably best avoided in most circumstances, especially as with skirmishers, they're going to be able to move 2d6 in order to do that anyway. So realistically, that's one of those situations that shouldn't be coming up very often at all. The important thing to remember is everybody shooting has got a 90 degree forward arc of um, engagement. So that's uh, 45 degrees to the right, 45 degrees to the left, and basically straight ahead. But once again, if we're talking about skirmishers, be they dedicated skirmish troops or be they uh, troops with flexible drill operating as skirmishers, they're going to be able to move before they throw or launch missiles. So um, that is probably a situation that's fairly easily avoided. The only exception with regards to line of sight is Roman archers who can shoot over the heads of friendly troops. But you still need to be able to trace a clear line of sight for them, just ignoring those intervening troops. If there's a, you know, a, a 20 foot high wall here, you can't shoot over the top of it. Um, <clears throat> where a shooter is on a higher level, say on a hill or a dike, you can shoot over the heads of intervening friendly troops. But this can only occur when the target is not within four inches of friendly troops and the missile group is closer to the intervening friendly troops. So if we had, um, uh, let us say, these uh, Romans, uh, let's put them to one side. If we had these Romans uh, here and we had slingers on the hill behind them, these guys have got to be closer to them than they are to them. So they would be able to do it if those Romans were there they would not be able to do it. It's simply a case of maintaining a decent line of sight, even though you're on the higher ground. Common sense should really dictate this, to be honest with you, and I'm sure in 99% of our games that's precisely what will happen, but there's, there's nothing here that really breaks the rules of basic common sense. So when can our groups shoot? Well, skirmishers will be able to shoot whenever they're activated. They can move, as we've seen, as well as shoot but will drop 1d6 of movement to throw, shoot, or loose their missiles. So they normally go 3d6, so they'll only go 2d6, and away they'll go. Now, if our, if our barbarians are heading towards the Romans, they can shoot whenever they are activated, or, more correctly, they can throw their javelins whenever they are activated. 
Remember, these are warriors and uh, they can combine moving with throwing javelins with no movement reduction. So they'll usually want to throw their missiles uh, when they get into range. So if they've moved up into this position and they were in range, they could throw uh, their javelin then. And then when they're next activated, if they want to charge into combat, at some point during that charge, they're going to chuck missiles as they go. There's no movement reduction for that. However, if it were the other way around and these were Roman warriors throwing pillar or, auxil or auxilia throwing uh, javelins, as part of their, they would do so as part of their drill system. So it's not free. They can still do it, they can still move and throw uh, missiles, but they must use either a command initiative from the leader who's commanding them or a signa card to do it. Now, it's important here because drill means that they do have the huge advantage that they can do this at any time during a turn, not just when activated. So if they're standing there and the barbarians are activated and coming towards them, they have the ability to respond to the barbarian charge by interrupting it to throw pillar as long as they have got the signa cards to do so, because clearly when it's an enemy's activation, it's going to be a Signa card they use to do it and not a command initiative. Whereas when they're activated, the leader presumably will have a spare command initiative that he's going to want to do that. So, um, the shooting mechanism is pretty quick and simple. The player shooting names the target and then rolls their dice. You roll 1d6 for every two warriors or 1d6 for every single skirmisher. And the only exception to this is warriors with flexible drill, as we talked about a minute ago, who will roll a number of uh, dice appropriate to what formation they're in. So if they're skirmishing, they'll roll one dice per man, and when they're in close or open order, um, they'll roll um, one for every two in that situation. Now, all skirmishers normally hit on a five or six, but they can add plus one to this, if they use a Signa card to darken the skies. This is our classic skirmish troops who've got that darken the skies ability. Now, top tactical tip as we seem to be incorporating these into these programs, if your barbarians with slingers use them against the legion as uniquely, they can reduce the heavy armour that they have to medium armour. Now you are most likely to achieve shock, because that's what happens when you throw missiles. However, this is not a bad result because it limits their leader's ability, uh, command ability, because they're going to have to use up command initiative to rally those points of shock off and, or use valuable Signa cards when they're rallying as part of their drill. Don't expect your slingers to be mowing down the enemy so they've got a machine gun. Getting one hit, uh, one kill, is a major victory for these guys. By reducing the number of men in the group, you are also lowering the point at which shock really starts to have an effect. So make the most of these chaps. Don't waste them on a futile exchange with enemy skirmishers if you can. Get them hitting those legion and just chipping away at the edges. It will reap benefits. Okay, pillar and scorpions are the exceptions when uh, shooting as they hit on four or more. Again, they're more likely to do shock, or more importantly, reduce fervour on the barbarians attacking them. Surviving that initial impact and getting the barbarians to the point where they have no fervour on them is often the tipping point where the initiative shifts from the barbarians to the Romans. So sh throwing your pillar in the face, or javelins if you're auxilia, in the face of an enemy charge can really help with that. If the enemy are relying on fervour to extend their movement to actually get to you, then in some cases you can actually stop them making contact and that's the point where the barbarian charge has run out of steam even before it's arrived. So another tactical tip there for the Romans, try and keep some of those Signa cards up your sleeve for at least one volley of pillar and if you've got two you can interrupt twice and have two volleys of pillar as the barbarians come in and that can be a very big hit, which again, if your barbarians is telling you why you need to be chipping away at those Signa cards that the Romans have. It's a case of trying to get the initiative in your hands and not in your opponent's hands. Okay, so let's imagine we've got our two groups here and the barbarians are throwing their javelins at them. Once we know the number of hits, you apportion them out. So uh, that's always going to be 
the first hit is always going to be on the target group and then you apportion them out. So if we have four groups here it will be target group, then group two, group three, group four because they are all within two inches. However in this situation uh, obviously the first hit on them, next hit on them. So if we get an odd number the majority of hits are always going to be on uh, the target group in this situation or if we have three groups and we got four hits there'll be two hits on the target group because the first one goes on it then you cycle through the others and then go back to the first one again so uh, the target group will tend to always take more hits than anybody else as is quite rightly the case because um, that's who they're chucking them at. Um, okay uh, once they're there the first uh, we've done that at the hits we know where the hits are the first hits are on them it's then simply a case of rolling for the hits on each group and taking armour into account. What you don't do, what you don't do is say, right, we've got six hits and we roll six dice and you get one kill and one point of shock and then you apportion them equally between the groups. You mustn't do that. You've got to work out the hits on each group and then roll to see the damage for each group individually because that's where you're going to get imbalance and that's potentially where the challenge is going to be uh, to keep these groups together as a formation. So dividing the hits before you roll for effect is very important. So as we know the effect is going to be dependent on the armour uh, quality of the target unit. The better the armour the less damage they're likely to take. But if a leader is attached to a group which loses figures killed you roll a d6 and if the number rolled is less than the number of figures killed in that group during that turn the leader is hit and there's a table to check results for that. I'm not going to go through that because it's a table and you roll the dice. It's fairly obvious. Um, normally you won't bother rolling if there's only been one figure killed in a group uh, that's with a leader as you can't roll under one. But don't forget the infamy deck because that can alter that so you never know whether you're safe or not. Uh, chariot mounted warriors use exactly the same mechanism. They roll one uh, dice for every two warriors in that group. But don't forget they also roll for further when they make such an attack uh, for nobles. So it's well worth getting two or three volleys in before committing these uh, people, uh, chaps or ladies, of course, with Bodicea kicking around and some of her uh, uh, local women's institute, I'm sure. Um, so worth using them to raise that fervour uh, with a few volleys of javelins before you go into close quarter actions. They are very fast and rapid as we saw in yesterday's programme about movement. Now, finally let's mention ammunition. Roman warriors get two rounds, barbarian warriors get three rounds. Skirmishers are unlimited this is on foot, as is the Scorpion. You can resupply your groups from a mule train, but as we'll see in another program, that's going to be at the back near the baseline where it deploys when the leader comes on. Effectively, your mule train is representing your line of communication and lines of supply, which is why that's where you get your supplies from. Right, well, let us have a look at mounted groups. Now, there are two types of mounted groups. We've got mounted warriors like these... Um, rather swanky looking uh, Gallic nobles here who are always happy to do a bit of uh, skirmishing and we've got troops like these British tribal cavalry here who are a lot lighter uh, troops uh, and really skirmishing is their middle name. Um, both of this lot have got uh, three rounds of javelins to throw. Gallic nobles can replant more from those stewards when they fall back on them. Uh, generally three is pretty good for a, for a game after which they tend to want to get stuck in anyway. Skirmishers can throw javelins as they move into contact with the enemy which gives them a bit of a bang when they go in and make contact. Nobles can't, yes they've got javelins but at that point in time they're getting their swords out and they are much more interested at that point in time in putting on a heroic display uh, than they are in uh, chucking bits of wood about. Once again the mechanism for throwing missiles is exactly the same with five or six to hit and the hits are apportioned to any group with any groups within two inches of the target. Uh, in exactly the same way as we saw before and that the rolls for effect are once again are based entirely on the target's armour level. 
So that's missiles, uh, nice and simple which missiles was intended to be. The primary form of combat in ancient warfare is really when troops are going to be getting stuck in but do not for a minute overlook the importance of those initial exchanges. As we've seen if you can uh, if you are barbarian, if you can weaken the Romans at all, it's going to go immensely in your favour. If you are Roman, you really need to be um, reducing the fervour on those barbarian troops and using missiles is a great way to doing that. And just as importantly, it's trying to get that effect where you get an imbalance in the level of fervour on the barbarian groups. Um, you know, if the barbarians have got two groups and one group's on five and the other group's on two, one's in a great position but the other's not. And using your missiles to get that effect is a really effective way of doing that. So uh, don't overlook the, the missiles engagement early phase of the battle at all. Right, if there's anything you feel that I've missed, uh, please do put your comments and questions below. As you saw at the top of the programme, we do listen and try and write anything that we've got wrong. Next time we'll be getting stuck into close combat, so please do join us for that. See you soon.